on road safety risk and we've got independent contractor risk and what do we value you know human life versus the status of an independent contractor um you can kind of see where i sit on the issue uh which maybe i shouldn't spoke my heart quite so much but I think, you know i'm a human like I, I value human life um so to greg's point if if you can't tie it back to the the customer or some type of governmental requirement what do you do you know there's all kinds of really really innovative uh technology out there that allows a trucking company allows a driver to operate a safer operation uh, it allows them to protect the drivers it allows them to protect the the general public and the reality is very little if any of that technology is required by customers and to my knowledge none of it really other than maybe arguably an eld is our uh, a requirement of uh, any governmental entity. Trucking is difficult. It's an essential industry that every corner of the nation depends on, even without knowing it. To the average consumer, the supply chain is magic and sometimes a black hole. Products on store shelves, dinner on restaurant tables, packages on doorsteps. It's expected to be there on time, every time, and only recognized if there's a service failure. But how is a sausage made? Who's talking about the issues that matter to trucking companies? Welcome to True North Truck Thought, or the Triple T Pod for short, a monthly podcast hosted by Scopolitas Transportation Consulting and brought to you by True North Companies. We're here to demystify the magic, address the black holes, and to talk trucking to the industry we love. Whether it's the latest research, upcoming laws and rules, safety issues and solutions, or practical discussions about real life supply chain challenges, the Triple T Pod is here to help the most important industry in our country to navigate its greatest challenges and opportunities. We bring together some of the best and brightest experts to talk about and tackle some of the most pressing industry issues. So without further ado, I'm Steve Kepler. And I'm Sean Garney. Let's get trucking. Hello and welcome back to the Triple T Pod. Today we're here to revisit a popular topic, independent contractors. As we know, independent contractors play an important role in our industry and represent critical capacity needed to deliver the nation's freight. But unfortunately, this model occasionally comes under attack by opponents who argue that independent contractors are misclassified and look a lot more like employees than independent business people. Managing this risk is a full-time job and tracking and adapting to the shifting landscape can be both confusing and challenging. In January of this year, the Wage and Hour Division of the U.S. Department of Labor issued a final rule modifying the analysis it uses to determine employee and independent contractor classification under the Fair Labor Standards Act. About a year ago, we had Greg Fury and Chris Galker on the podcast to discuss this proposal. Now, with the DOL's final rule on the streets and scheduled to become effective March 11th, 2024, we've invited them back for an update and to discuss how motor carriers should respond. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our guest today. The first is Chris Galker, Executive Vice President of Transportation at True North Companies. Chris oversees True North's asset light practice, where he helps companies understand the nuances of the independent contractor owner operator model and helps companies protect and maximize the utilization, their utilization of independent contractors. We're also pleased to welcome Greg Fury, President and Managing Partner at the renowned transportation law firm Scopolitas, Garvin, Light, Hansen, and Fury. Greg is perhaps the preeminent legal expert in the field of independent contractors and trucking whose resume is absolutely a mile long. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Sean. Good to be here. Well, thanks, gentlemen. We appreciate you joining us. Um, so why don't we, to, to kick things off, maybe, Greg, you just start, if you don't mind, uh, just kind of walk us through the main points of the of the, the DOL rule and how it might differ from the previous rule. So let me back all the way up to the previous rule, which was the first rule on the subject of independent contractor status um, published by the U.S. Department of Labor, who often referred to as the Trump rule or the 2020 rule. Prior to that, for 70 years, we didn't have a rule per se that instructed the Department of Labor and its administrative law judges on how to adjudicate 
whether a worker was an independent contractor or an employee. The Trump rule uh, was um, put in place in 2020 and was decidedly entrepreneurial favorable. So it was, we considered it a balanced rule uh, juxtaposed against this now new rule that came out in uh, January, which is um, decidedly employee favored. The uh, Trump rule took what is referred to as the common law economic realities test and interpreted it in a way that would allow for an efficient adjudication. And again, with kind of an open mind towards entrepreneurship and independent contractor status. The same general economic realities test for this new rule that was just published January 10th um, is announced as in fact an, an employee inclusive rule. In other words, a rule that leans towards the findings of employment. There is, when you compare these rules, Steve uh, and Sean, there's an interim, a proposed rule that was pushed out in 2022 that was, had many, many interpretations with a very heavy thumb on the scale of employment. The new rule actually is a little bit better than the proposed rule. And as we as we discuss further, I can go into more details, and I'm sure Chris can too. But that kind of sets the stage for where we are. We have a uh, Department of Labor independent contractor test under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which primarily addresses minimum wage and overtime. One last comment on that, for heavy trucking in interstate operations, there is a motor carrier um, exemption from overtime. So primarily the DOL would be focused on enforcing the Fair Labor Standards Act in trucking with respect to minimum wage. Uh, a substan substantial part of trucking really has never had a history of minimum wage abuse. So I don't expect an enormous push from the DOL at truck heavy trucking using this rule. It's a rule that applies across all industries in America. And I would, I would suspect, we won't know yet, that um, the DOL will uh, uh, focus its attention on industries that have abused minimum wage or that have an overtime issue. Um, with that, one last caveat, it, you know, we are in a, as we all know, a very political environment. So depending on who's pushing the buttons and who's pandering to whom, we may in fact see the DOL uh, go after trucking for political purposes. So I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Um, it's, it's super interesting. This idea that, okay, we're just going over after wage an hour and, you know, generally speaking, um, truck drivers get paid well and that sort of thing. Of course, we enjoy that fair, fair labor standards act exemption, but there has been some grumbling over the years about, you know, attacking that as well. If we were to lose that exemption uh, as an industry, would then this rule sort of really constitute a much bigger challenge for us? Um, you would expect so, because interstate trucking does operate well outside the, you know, nine to five, you know, the, the hours of service mm -hmm. allow, allow us to operate into over into the overtime arena so yes uh, it, we would have concern there interesting well let's dive a little bit more into the rule there's there's a turn of phrase that i've heard a lot you know the the trump rule or the 2020 rule as you talked about sort of had two uh, dispositive factors that really sort of controlled and now we're moving to this totality of circumstance sort of uh, calculation. Can you describe what a totality of circumstances and why why that's important to me? So, as you mentioned, the Trump rule really set up an early litmus test. If they had 
two of the five economic reality factors were the lead indicators, right of control and opportunity for profit and loss. The administrator or the administrative law judge was supposed to make initial inquiry on whether, um, we'll use our vernacular here, whether a motor carrier is exercising too much control and whether the owner operator has uh, an appropriate opportunity for profit, profit or loss. If with regard to those two indicators, they pointed in the same direction, either employment or independent contractor status, the rest of the factors need not be considered and the administrative law judge can make a determination just on those two factors. Fast forward to the new rule, um, a sixth factor was added back in. All six factors are used effectively equally to, to make a balancing determination. This isn't like AB5. I want to make sure we put this in context. This is not a one strike and you're out like AB5 is. Three factors. If you don't get one of them right, you're out. It's an employment determination. This is a multi-factor balancing test or a totality of circumstances where the judge looks to see whether enough factors line up in favor of independent contractor status or enough factors line up in favor of employment status and makes a determination on the entire picture of the relationship between the owner operator and the motor carrier. So mm, it sounds like it got a lot more complicated <laughs> and you used, you used the word efficient adjudication earlier when you talked about the Trump rule. And I'm guessing that's what you must've been talking about. The fact that if we can just dispense with those two factors, then we have our decision already. Is this well, going to really slow some things down or? I, I, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good insight uh, by you, Sean. I think it is going back to, the way it was, but with interpretations built into it that will make it highly subjective. Mm. And we are always concerned about sub subjectivity in this arena because politics tend to creep into a subjective adjudication process. So if you've got mm. adjudicators that kind of want to see employment in a subjective test, they're able to find employment by picking and choosing facts that meet their narrative. So, yeah, I think mm -hmm. it will be more complex. But the flip side is this, and I'll go back to it, say it one more time. But it is not taking away the owner operator's business like AB5 was or is. Yeah, so I, I think from that perspective, I think it's a good thing. Um, and, and you mentioned you know, the profit and loss. And I think a lot of folks listening are probably are pretty familiar with um, the tests for that. Um, did the, the rule that just, did the rule adjust that at all? Change those, I mean, is there anything different yeah, with this yeah, new rule? Excellent question, Steve. Sorry to interrupt you. It did, um, especially within the context of investment. The, 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 the final rule came out and, specifically recognize that buying a truck is a capital or a business investment. That's good news for heavy trucking. Maybe not as good a news for courier where personal vehicles are used because it went the other direction, said that an investment in a uh, personal vehicle would not necessarily be deemed a capital investment. You'd have to kind of prove other aspects of the investment and the opportunity for profit and loss. One other area in that arena that um, was good news was a recognition that accepting or rejecting dispatch is an exercise of management skill by the owner operator to determine profit or loss. So, in a world where I think all trucking knows there should be no forced dispatch over owner operators, demonstrating that owner operators have a choice of accepting or rejecting each dispatch helps immensely in this arena of uh, opportunity for profit and loss. Yeah, you know, Greg, I just had a, uh, an 
interaction with with somebody the other day about this opportunities for profit and loss and and the value of negotiation between the motor carrier and the independent contractor. Um, and one of the things that we were discussing was whether that negotiation. So, so a, a lot of companies in the space, they're they're they offer a load and a rate, and that offer doesn't typically come with an offer of negotiation. Is Simply making the choice that I prefer this load over that load is that en- enough of a negotiation in profit? You know, to to prove I'm impacting my own profit and loss based on my ability to run a business. Yeah, yeah. it's a a really difficult question because in certain arenas that would be an absolutely effective argument that says the way I determine a negotiated rate is I pick and choose higher rated loads. Um, and, and in that way, I've, I've effectively negotiated my way into running my business at a higher profit margin. Excellent obser- observation. In in left-leaning or paternal um, jurisdictions, I'm not sure that argument is necessarily going to win the day. But what my personal experience in counseling motor carriers for 36 years, there is many opportunities for negotiation beyond just the stated rate. Often motor carriers need to offer more expense reimbursements or more money to move loads off the docks at critical times. What I find a little frustrating at times is that is a frequent practice in trucking, but not always frequently archived, saved, and mm. available when you're adjudicating these claims. Sometimes you don't have that evidence, despite the fact that everybody knows it's going on. So that is another thing that we always tell our, our clients is, I know you negotiate, preserve that, archive that, whether that's emails or recorded conversations, make sure that you can demonstrate at a later date that you're offering, you know, an increase in the rate or you're subsidizing a travel expense so that they can get to the origin that they that they need to get to to, to pick up the load. So um, good another good point, Sean. That, that's yeah, that's really good advice, Greg. Um, another so another thing that's part of the rule talks about the degree of permanence, right? Um, of the relationship is another factor. Um, and and uh, so if if an IC is only servicing um, one motor carrier, can they still be considered an IC or how, how do you think that might play out? So this, this issue of permanency is hand in glove with the issue of exclusivity often. And that's actually where you pivoted to, Steve, which is where most people do. Um, on permanency, we do counsel that annual independent contractor agreements rather than evergreen agreements that are in perpetuity mm. are important. Exclusivity is an issue in heavy trucking because the federal leasing regulations to some degree build in a certain amount of exclusivity that can be misinterpreted as an intention of permanence. Um, I, we hope that by virtue of having these regulations in place that have to be complied with, that some of that type of exclusivity or permanence is uh, determined by the adjudicators is not probative of the issue of independent contractor employment status. Um, thanks, Greg. Let's uh, let's move on to everybody's favorite. Uh, factor here, the the nature and degree of control, and I'd like to draw Chris in here too um, for some practical impacts. But I know that there was some concern. I remember this conversation from about a year ago about sort of the safe haven of government regulation and customer requirements, and how you know if we could if we could ground our you know our decisions in things that that the law requires of us or that our customers require of us, that was a bit of a safe space. Is that still true in the final rule, um, Greg? And and if so, Chris, how are you working with, with carriers to sort of 
find that safe space, you know, because we've got a conflict here, a, a terrible conflict to choose from between like um, how robust my safety programs might be, you know, from a company perspective and, you know, what my my other risk might be. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Chris respond, but I'll be quick. The two areas that you've mentioned, Sean, are customers require a certain protocol. And is that probative of me, the motor carrier, controlling the owner operator? That has not been the case in case law across the country for years. You're correct. If you can show that you're not controlling the owner operator, it's, it's a customer service requirement. Generally, that it's a safe space. And then the other safe space uh, is compliance with law. In this new rule, they do they recognize that strict compliance with the law remains a safe place. I think it's a little uh, less certain as to whether um, showing that what you're doing is just simply servicing a customer request, whether that will be a safe place. And I'll let Chris take it from there. Yeah, I think the fact that we have to ask that question is a little sad, right? I mean, we've got on-road safety risk and we've got independent contractor risk. And what do we value? You know, human life versus the status of an independent contractor. Um, you can kind of see where I sit on the issue, uh, which <laughs> it's tough to tell. <laughs> so much, but I think, you know, I'm a human, like I, I value human life. Um, so to Greg's point, if, if you can't tie it back to the, the customer or some type of governmental requirement, what do you do? You know, there's all kinds of really, really innovative uh, technology out there that allows a trucking company, allows a driver to operate a safer operation. Uh, it allows them to protect the drivers. It allows them to protect the, the general public. And the reality is very little, if any of that technology is required by customers. And to my knowledge, none of it really, other than maybe arguably an ELD, is our, uh, a requirement of uh, any governmental entity. Um, so you start thinking right. about crash mitigation technology, whether that's lane keep assist or uh, automatic braking, or the you know one of the fresher topics out there in recent years of cameras uh, and monitoring uh, the, the actual performance of a driver. None of that's required. So that gets into that uh, gray area, or maybe it's not even gray, you know, it's pretty black and white, I guess it sounds like is that that would be a more indicative of employer like control. Um, so to your question, I, how do we solve for that? You know, True North is in a unique position in that uh, we're, we're not the government, we're not a customer, we're an insurance broker. Uh, and we like to get creative when we get into sticky situations like this. And so we've actually had a lot of success in developing incentive programs for independent contractors that are ultimately tied back to insurance programs that allow us, the insurance broker, uh, to be the hammer, uh, get the motor carrier out of that relationship and be able to still deploy some of that leading edge type of technology to make A, the fleet safer, but then B, help support the overall risk financing strategy because you're able to, to provide that, that level of risk mitigation without necessarily jeopardizing independent contractor status. Now, I'll say one last thing and then I'll pause. Um, it is wildly important and we've leveraged Greg and his team to help consult on how do we set these types of uh, engagements up that it, it isn't a motor carrier initiative. Um, so I just want to kind of throw that out there is there's nuances that you have to be extremely careful of or else it's all smoke and mirrors and uh, doesn't really help the IC status at all. Hmm. Well, that's it. Yeah, I think some really good points for sure. Um, and maybe picking up, I think, Chris, on one of the things you talked about, kind of these innovative areas and, and you talked about cameras, right? Cameras are becoming more commonplace in the market for lots of different reasons. Um, and and so carriers that are using it in the right way are not just they're, they're coaching their drivers, right? So 
So when we talk about coaching plans, um, when we're using that technology, um, you know how how do the how does the carrier balance that that mis, that classification risk versus crash risk? So where where are you kind of where are you advising your clients on that space? Yeah, I I can chime in first here. Um, you know, if if we can tie an incentive program to really encourage independent contractors to participate in a camera program that has quote unquote coaching, we use different terminology because again, these are independent contractors. We're not really coaching them. It's more of a knowledge transfer process. Um, we're able to kind of get the best of both worlds. Now, in any of these programs we've launched, we've reached nowhere near 100% participation. And that's okay. Again, it needs to be the independent contractor's decision. And if they can see a return on their investment of time, then we believe that's actually a, a positive factor uh, in that, you know, they're able to achieve some type of financial ROI in the time that they invest in that knowledge transfer program by putting these cameras in their in their vehicles. And so we actually, as again, the insurance broker, we've developed a robust uh, team uh, that actually provides that person to person, quote unquote, coaching, again, knowledge transfer that takes the motor carrier safety department out of that conversation. So the way they manage it for an employee driver, if they've got mixed capacity is wildly different. It's, you know, their safety team, you know, somebody managing and monitoring those in cab events versus True North managing and monitoring those in cab events and then deploying the right resource, whether that be, uh, you know, videos or again, person to person um, conversations, knowledge transfer, to protect the IC status. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I, I want to kind of jump off from there. You know, a lot of the one of the big reasons why people use independent contractors is because it helps them sort of flex capacity, right? Change with with changing demands and that sort of thing. Um, you had just mentioned uh, managing a fleet with mixed capacity. Um, you know, is it that simple to just add an independent contractor to my fleet or, or both Greg and, and Chris, is there important sort of corporate structure things that, that need to be considered to sort of safeguard those? How do we manage a mixed fleet? Do we need to segregate everything or how does that work? Well, certainly our council um, focuses to some degree on the IRS 530 Safe Harbor which has a number of factors in it, one of which is what referred to as the substantive consistency factor. And the question before you're able to avail yourself of the IRS safe harbor is, has the work that we're focused on ever been done by an employee in the past? Um, so when you drop in independent contractors into an employment environment, um, there is a potential for that particular factor not to be met. And it can be the more difficult factor of the, of the three factors. So we don't counsel that you parachute in independent contractors into an employment environment for that technical reason, but there are other good reasons not to do it as well. Uh, often the managers and dispatchers and frontline people that deal with the owner operators don't have experience in that arena. They, they have more experience dealing with employees. That's a different mindset. It's a different way of dealing with drivers. Um, so sometimes you get uh, circumstances uh, that don't produce very good results when it comes to independent contractor status when you possibly have a dispatcher that's more focused on making sure somebody gets to origin and then gets the destination and um, possibly gives them the impression that they don't have a lot of choices. Um, mm -hmm. so, so the recipe for success often is not to have mixed fleets, um, to run an enterprise with different models for different purposes. And I know Chris has some a specific input on that, so I'll, I'll let him take uh, take the floor. Yeah, well, I'll caveat with my comment that, you know, I forget Sean or Steve who gave the intro here, but 
Greg's known to be the preeminent expert on independent contractor status, and I've learned most of what I know through the last decade listening to webinars and conference presentations from Greg. So I, I'm just reusing material he's he's taught at me the last decade. <laughs> but I mean, if we really think about an independent contractor as a business, an employee as an employee, they're two uniquely different and distinct individuals and entities in their own right. And so, you know, we have a ton of clients that operate both types of capacity. And I'll tell you, more often than not, when we first start working with an organization, there's a lot of lines that are blurred. They're using common terminology. You know, they're hiring independent contractors and they're hiring employees. No, you're not. Mm. You're hiring employing and you're <laughs> contracting with owner operators. Like there's a lot of those basic kind of blocking and tackling issues that we see, even how recruiting uh, presents itself uh, in terms of trying to attract both types of drivers. And you'll see the same job posting. You'll see the same, uh, you know, again, vernacular used in those environments. So it's not that it can't be done, but when you think about the foundation of what is an independent contractor and what is an employee, they're just so wildly different. You know, why do you commingle the two? And if you do, make sure you're mm -hmm. doing it the right way. You've got your attorneys looking at corporate structure and you've got your communications team really looking closely at what language is being used and your operational team, you know, making sure that the business is managed in a way that's appropriate for the model that you're using in that particular segment. Well, I, I, Hard to speak two languages at once, probably. Eh? <clears throat> yeah, for, for sure. Well, I, you know, yeah, I think the message there clearly is you have to be intentional about it. You can't just jump in without thinking it through, right? Um, it, it maybe one, so a lot of folks don't know all the details of what we're talking about. And a lot of folks from the immediate, meet the press and, you know, like the California and ABC test gets a lot of oxygen, right? Um, and, and so, Greg, you mentioned earlier that this is not the ABC test. Um, maybe quickly just tell people that they're thinking that, how is this, how is this different? And, you know, how is it struck, you know, how does it present differently? Actually, um, I can't think of an exception other than the ABC test. There may be one out there in some uh, rule that I'm not aware of, um, but unlike uh, the ABC test, every other test that is used to determine whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor has a number of factors. The IRS calls used to call theirs the 20 factor test. So there were 20 factors at one time. There's, I think, 19 at this point. Um, the economic realities test that we've been talking about has six factors. There's the Borello test in California that has they were between 11 and 13. Anyways, many, many, many tests across many states and federal government applied to many different laws you, that all create this totality of circumstances balancing, determining how many factors indicate employment, how many factors independent uh, indicate independent contractors. The one test that's different than all those is the ABC test. The ABC test, as I said earlier, is a one strike and you're out. California AB5 is based on the ABC test. That ABC test asks three questions. And as a motor carrier, you have to prove all three, that you don't control the daily details, that the, the work that's being done is not in the same trade profession or occupation as the work that you do as a motor carrier or is not integral. And the third is that the worker, um, their business is independently established. If you can't prove any one of those three, the determination is that the worker is an, an, an employee. And that seemingly simple three-factor test with one strike and you're out is so heavily leaning in favor of employment status. In fact, so much to the point where the California Supreme Court said, 
We are importing this ABC test so that we have the ability to find in most cases that workers are employees to protect those workers with our California employment laws. So so it really is the Republic of California, you know? <laughs> it it, it sure. to be what, what we all know. It's a very paternal, um, left-leaning, some would say socialistic perspective on work. And what I think is upsetting to so much, so many folks in trucking is the vast majority, and Chris, Chris can back me up on this or disagree, the vast majority of owner operators and the vast majority of motor carriers are saying, just tell me how to establish a relationship yeah. where I can, I can function as an independent business with this motor carrier. Because that's what I want to be. And when you think about the fact that there are, you know, anywhere from seven to one to 20 to one employment truck driving jobs available compared to owner operator jobs, it would seem logical that you would come up with the conclusion that if you want to be an employee truck driver, it isn't all that hard to find opportunity. (laughs) But the government is saying this with an ABC test. We don't need you to look for an opportunity somewhere else. We're going to change your relationship in midstream into an employment relationship. You don't need to go apply for a job. We'll just call your job an employment job and we'll take away your business. And, and that's, you know, you waking up one day and finding that your business is gone when you were about to let your kids jump into it and start working. And, you know, everybody talks about J.B. Hunt. J.B. Hunt was, you know, John Brown, um, it, you know, the one man, one truck operation. These are not all of them are going to be J.B. Hunts, but they're every bit as valuable to those people as mm-hmm. independent businesses. I don't know, Chris, if that's how you see it, but that's I think how I see it. Yeah, I don't. It's been a few years since I've looked at the numbers, but I appreciate your comment there. The last time I had looked, the estimate was somewhere around 350 to 500,000 independent contractor drivers in the market compared to somewhere around plus or minus, I think, 3 million CDL holders, class A CDL holders. Um, so minimum, you're in that seven or eight or 10 to one. And I, I mean, maybe the market being what it is today from a freight standpoint, maybe not every company has an open door right now in terms of trying to recruit new drivers. But in recent times, you've got a massive capacity gap and anywhere anyone is looking for more drivers. And if you've got an employment model, there's, again, any independent contractor could get hired tomorrow if they're a you know, quality driver, obviously, with a positive background. But, you know, again, whether it's the J.B. Hunt or the 20 unit company that started as an owner operator that's now creating a a true entrepreneurial business um, and being able to provide for their family and provide for the families of, you know, probably 30 other individuals. When you think about other drivers and staff, that's meaningful. That's what our, our economy, that's what our country was built on, is built on. Uh, And so to try to put a test out there that says we're going to mitigate the number of people in certain markets that should or shouldn't be independent contractors just takes away that option for individuals. Yeah. Thanks. And I think this is begging this conversation to go a little political. And so maybe I'll ask a little bridge question here uh, to get us over to that, get us over to that. Um, I think a lot of motor carriers in the industry leverage the lease purchase agreements as a way to to bring independent contractors into the fold. Um, You know, we know the truck leasing task force just came out, I think this morning and said, we want to look at all the truck leases and make sure that everybody's happy. And so, you know, there's sort of, you know, some attacks coming from from different areas there. What what does, if anything, the the final rule say about lease purchase, Uh, Greg and Chris, where do you do you see a trend towards or away from lease purchase as a method of of capturing independent contractors? So interestingly, the same administration that has stood up this truck leasing task force to based on 
I think suspicion of inequity um, has also an, uh, a department that actually does not denigrate lease purchase programs. The final rule uh, requires that the that a lease purchase program be market reasonable and be portable and be of free choice, but it does not effectively say that lease purchase programs are categorically or axiomatically indicative of employment. So it opens the door for lease purchase programs, this rule. Um, despite the fact that the same administration that's influ influencing uh, another area of this task force seems to suggest that lease purchase programs are a bad thing. Certainly in the wrong hands with the wrong motivations, uh, just like anything in any industry, they can be a bad thing. Uh, but generally across the board in trucking, they are not. Uh, Chris? Yeah, the truck leasing task force, I, I'll speak to that quickly. I actually, those uh, sessions have been open to the public on Zoom, and I've had the opportunity to listen in on some of them. Um, and it's interesting, it's almost like that group was formed because they were on an answer and they were then going out to pursue evidence of that answer. Uh, and so, you know, I had read they're going out to the Mid American Truck Show to try to get lease purchase agreements. And I'll go on record and say, I get it. There are companies that have put predatory leasing arrangements in place. And I'll also go on record and saying, let's all go after them, frankly. Like, not that, that totally ruins hmm. the independent contractor model for those that are actually running a legitimate IC model. And so I think we would all be in favor. I don't know anybody that's not in favor of getting rid of the bad actors, because frankly, that creates more opportunity for those who are actually doing it the right way. And that assumes that there is a right way. And to Greg's point, the way I understand it, yes, there is the right way. You know, if you're making sure you've checked the boxes, you can look at some big cases that have happened in the last three or four years that are centered around the lease purchase model and really learn some important lessons about what to do, what not to do. Things like, you know, portability, for example, is the only option to lease that truck back to the motor carrier versus if their independent contractor agreement for some reason is terminated, do they have the option to continue on with that lease? So there, there's all kinds of, you know, boxes to check to make sure you're doing it the right way, just like anything else we've talked about. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Greg, thanks, Chris, and both you guys. It's really good insight because that is a sticky wicket um, and can be for sure. Um, so, Greg, I think, Greg, you mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, for almost 70 years, the, the, the DOL really left this alone until 2020. Um, but, and it's been such a big deal since then. Why, I mean, why do you think they're choosing now to jump in with this full bore? What, what's your sense? I mean, is it become more of a, it seems like it's become such a political issue now versus anything else. What's your sense there? Well, there's certainly political players involved, the organized labor, trial attorneys, um, and on it goes. Uh, you certainly had California AB5 uh, made the news. Even before that, there was a series of articles called Rig in USA Today that suggested, mm -hmm. uh, strongly suggested that the entire port drainage industry in California was indentured servitude, or at least tried to make the case that that was the norm or the standard versus the outlier. So it it's it's a popular notion that trucking uh, had abusers, uh, and as Chris said, uh, were predators. And they're, but but not the majority, uh, a really small minority, uh, are conducting their operations in the wrong way. Probably no different than every single industry in America. There, there's always those people trying to look for an edge in the wrong way. To characterize that as the standard or the norm um, ends up getting 
the attention of legislators who are also trying to pander to certain constituencies. And I think that all bubbles up into what we have today is kind of a mixed political and legal issue um, that, you know, depending on what side of the issue you're on, uh, if you're a legislator can get you elected or, or, or possibly not. So I think, I think politics does come into play, Steve. But how does it, can I ask a so follow-up if, question, I, if I, uh, oh, please, Chris, yeah. please. I, I, I asked this because Greg and I were on a call with a shared client probably two weeks ago and your comments there just bring this up in my head of how do, how does the state legislative and political environment play into that, Greg? I, you, you articulated it very well on that call and I'd love to hear that for a, a wider audience. So I do, um, I do look at this from a political perspective and anybody, you know, we're not election year, right? So we have a keen focus on what the red states are and what the blue states are and what the purple states are. Um, this does run strongly along red state, blue state lines. At the state level, depending on how many owner operators are domiciled or residing in blue states versus red states, uh, you can certainly handicap the potential for misclassification liability. So for example, if you had 100 owner operators, 90 of which were domiciled in red states, um, you would suggest that the misclassification liability is much lower than if you had that same distribution in California, a, a very strong blue state. Um, and most of the litigation vis-a-vis -vis class action uh, is under wage and hour. Most of the regulatory action is under wage and hour. Some of it is certainly workers' comp and unemployment tax, but a, a, a good strong majority of what's going on in the nation with regard to litigation and regulatory assessments and fines is really at the state law level. So when you look at it, you, you do want to have a, a good sense of what the red state and blue state map looks like. I think that's what you're talking about, Chris. What? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Thanks. thanks for... Oh, sorry, Steve. No, I, I was just. Gonna... I, w I just wanted to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I just wanted. To, I wanted to follow up on that question because I I think it's it's interesting. Um, you know, we know that red states and blue states tend to sort of look at things differently. We also know that the DOL has spoken twice in the last three years and said exact opposite things. And I've read an analysis that your firm had done that said, oh, well, blue states will point to this one and red states will point to this one uh, as as reasonable arguments. So, you know, is muddying this water, is it now just a grab bag of arguments that we want to make? Or, I mean, do we have any more certainty or are we far less certain now? Well, we still we still have the rule of law. We still have stare decisis and precedent. And we still look at what the predisposition of a particular jurisdiction is to forecast the outcome. The thing that we don't have is a singular common fact pattern. So every time you walk into that jurisdiction, there are nuances with regard to the fact pattern that may make a difference on the outcome. If you look at the prior fact patterns and you compare that to your fact pattern and they line up, you can generally predict what the outcome will be. Mm. Yeah, but but back to our earlier discussion, when you have these multi-factor totality of the circumstances, balancing tests, there's a lot of subjectivity in that allows for adjudicators, even within a jurisdiction, to and justifies the means to come out where mm -hmm. they want to come out, picking and selecting facts. Uh, and unfortunately, you see that uh, bubble up even to uh, reported uh, court of appeals or higher case law. Yeah, it, it, you know, I think the what the thing that I was going to mention is kind of closing out this part of the conversation is, you know, my experience dealing with legislators. You know, the trucking industry is complicated, right? Then legislators have lots of things on their plate to deal with, and to me, this particular issue begs itself of people to engage with their legislators to make sure that they're educated on how this can impact their business. 
because they're listening to one one sector of the conversation. And it really, it, the trucking industry needs to be active on this. And I know it is, but at every, not just at the federal level, at the state level. Um, it's really, really important that they understand the ramifications of these decisions for sure. Um, so, so maybe kind of shifting. Um, so what's your sense, Greg, Chris, love, of, of is this rule going to be challenged? Do we, do we, is there, do we think there could be some, is there, what's your thoughts there? Um, yeah, it's, it's already being challenged in the fifth circuit um, by the coalition of worker innovation, CWI. Uh, I expect the chamber to give serious consideration to a challenge um, and other interest groups will challenge this rule. Um, you know, we're in an election year. And I certainly expect that if the administration changes uh, to a Republican administration, that you might well see this rule um, rescinded. So um, I, I think there's a lot left to be said about the rule. Um, and we'll wait and see. We, we don't even know how it's going to be enforced yet. Um, so, so a lot of uncertainty right now. Well, at least that means we can have a podcast every time there's a change in administration. Uh, and we can talk more about what, what, what that means. Um, one interesting angle on the challenge to these rules that, that I've been thinking a little bit about is this concept of like the Chevron deference, right? Whether or not we should grant deference to the, to the regulating agency as, as experts and less explicitly um, allowed by Congress. Do you think this is, this case is sort of, you know, ripe for for discussion about whether or not DOL should even be acting in this space. I mean, it's been seventy years; they were silenced. All, all of a sudden, you know, two years and three, two rules in three years, or whatever. Yeah, you know that that's a really smart question. the The question really becomes: once the administrative law judge makes a decision, it ultimately can be appealed into the court system. What are the courts expected to do? If there is, and the Supreme Court seems to be leaning towards um, abandoning this substantial deference to agencies in favor of maintaining uh, appropriate precedent within a particular jurisdiction. This is uniquely set up in that way because as I mentioned before, there's, 70 years of case law that would significantly impact how a judge might determine the outcome of a misclassification case against, as you said, three or four or five years of administrative uh, rules associated with specific, uh, this specific issue. So I do think that even with this rule in place, it may be um, primed for being overturned in the court system. Awesome. Well, um, it's been about 50 minutes of independent contractor talk. Um, the best 50 minutes of my day so far. So I think, I thank you gentlemen um, for that. I don't know if we have any sort of final thoughts here. Um, you know, I, I guess I would, I would ask maybe Greg and Chris on the way out to say, um, you know, just generally speaking, you know, what's one or two, I mean, I, I think the first tip that anybody who's concerned about their model should be to call Chris and Greg, I'll just say that out loud. Um, but other than that, how do you think, are there ways that motor carriers should respond to this today or do we really need to wait for it to, to sort of play out over time to know, to know how to react? So, so in my view, you use this as an opportunity to keep your house in order. Look at your independent contractor agreements. I've always said independent contractor agreements aren't necessarily going to win you a case, though there is some evidence and there are some cases where, in fact, they did but it can certainly hurt you. So a bad agreement is 
really problematic, whereas a good agreement at least keeps you on even keel. There are other things that you can look at within the context of your independent contractor program from websites to policy manuals to your insurance programs. And kind of with that, I'll let, I'll pivot over to Chris and let him comment. I agree with everything Greg said. Um, you know, it, I think I might have even said this a year ago when we talked about a similar topic, but, you know, having been around the independent contractor model for uh, about 11 years personally, um, it's always been in flux. Uh, there's never been a time where I think mm -hmm. I can say confidently we've planted a flag and said, all right, we're on the positive side of this battle now. It always seems to be you know, one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. And so I guess my point in saying all that is just echoing Greg's comment of these types of whether it's the Department of Labor or a special interest group where you start to see some activity at the plaintiff's attorney level around specific areas. Um, it's always something. So, you know, in terms of staying informed, staying aligned with right partners, that's why we like doing podcasts like this is it's, it's an opportunity to stay educated. Um, I think about state trucking associations, ATA, TCA, they do a heck of a job uh, doing everything they can to keep members informed. So I guess this is a subtle plug for the associations as well in a lot of ways of, you know, get involved. Um, Sean, I think you called it out. Steve, maybe it was you on you know, there's an opportunity here to have your voice heard. Um, it's kind of sad to think about how few people in our industry are involved. You think about calls on Washington and talking to your, uh, your representatives. Um, I'd be curious uh, if we did a poll after this, how many people said they have. Uh, and it's, it, it's actually quite an enlightening experience. And the only way for people to be informed about what matters to us as the trucking industry is to hear from them because otherwise they're making decisions and, and making assumptions based on pretty limited information. Well, and shout out and a plug for the IC ambassador program and a previous podcast where we had one of the ambassadors on the podcast, which I thought was great, but a wonderful program to do just what Steve had, had suggested, get out into your States, into your local areas and tell them about how essential your business is to the, to the economy and, and that sort of thing. Steve, any, Final thoughts before we wish these good gentlemen a uh, fine adieu. I think they wrapped it up great. I think just have these two guys on speed dial. That's all I'll say. That's right. That's right. Cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, really appreciate your knowledge and insight as usual. And I'm sure we'll have you back maybe if we get a new president. We'll see. Thanks for listening to this episode of True North Truck Thought. If you enjoyed the topic today and want to tune in for future conversations here, on the Triple T Pod, make sure to follow us. Also, please don't hesitate to let us know which topics you want us to cover in future episodes. Drop us a line in the comments section or send us an email to transportationnews at truenorthcompanies.com. Thanks and have a safe day.